I think that uh, for most people, hopefully, Christmas is uh, supposed to be a joyful time of year. Uh, you know, the decoration, everything's joyful. Look at this here. You know, everything is happy and joyful and bright. The music is joyful. The family activities full of warmth and good cheer. Hopefully, that's what we're shooting for. Even the overall attitude of society recognizes the higher good that this season brings out in everyone. You know, companies that have no religious affiliations, nevertheless, at Christmas time, uh, try to accentuate uh, their benevolent activities. Uh, everyone is kinder, hopefully, uh, during this time of year. But there is a paradox, an irony of sorts, that exists amid all of this happy mood, and that is that this holiday time of year is also the peak season for suicide and depression. And I don't think I'm telling you something that you don't already know. I think all of us are aware of that. This strange phenomenon repeats itself every year. As the general mood goes up, the number of suicides and doctor visits for depression also goes up. Some say that it's because extremes at one end of the social mood scale initiate extremes at the other end of the social mood scale. So this evening I'd, I'd like to examine this problem of grief and depression at Christmas time and how to deal with it if this is your experience or the experience of someone you love because certainly all of us, everybody here, has lost someone, has lost something, has been disappointed. You know, we, uh, it's a long list. It may not have happened you know, on December the 25th, my point is, but it kind of, it feels, <laughs> you feel it on December 25th. You know, my dad died 55 years ago uh, you know, in the springtime, but I miss him most of all on December 25th. And just a, a little uh, aside here, uh, you know how Marty and I, we tend to kind of compliment each other in our preaching and that, and so his article in the bulletin this morning uh, is about his dad and, and you know, that his dad is not there at this time of year. And I handed in my article you know, already for next Sunday, long before I saw this article this morning, and my article is about my dad and the fact that he's not here. So I think no matter where you are, where you're at, you know, you've got some reasons to to think about something that you've lost at this time of year. Now both research and personal experience tell us that people who have suffered significant loss, you know, the death of a loved one or loss of health or work, often find the holidays, Christmas, not just Christmas, you know, Thanksgiving too, they find this the hardest time to get through. It seems that as the mood of the people around them goes up in anticipation of the, you know, the vacation, the celebration, the activities, their mood proportionately goes down. Now there are specific reasons for this. We think of holidays as times of being together and for those who have lost someone, these times tend to highlight the fact that the person <laughs> that we love isn't there. A spouse that has gone through death or divorce perhaps, a family that is far away, children either dead or perhaps moved out of the house. Holidays tend to remind us of our aloneness. Another reason for personal difficulties is that high emotional times like Christmas tend to stir unhappy emotions along with good ones. You know, you got all these emotions inside of you. It's like a stew, you know, you got all kinds of veggies and meat and stuff. Well, you got all these emotions inside of you and then all of a sudden, Christmas time, Thanksgiving, a good happy time, where everything gets stirred up. The good and the bad get stirred up. Some people who are able to control their emotions at other times find it hard for them not to overflow with all of the emotional pressure applied during the holidays. And during the holidays, every movie is sentimental, every song is sentimental, every card is sentimental. 
You can't help feeling sad when everything is there to stimulate your emotions. The bittersweet nostalgic feelings we have at Christmas naturally tend to go to Christmas's past where we enjoyed other good things. For the person who has an unhappy childhood or who has lost someone or something that existed in the past, this, this backward focus tends to be a painful reminder of what they had and lost or what they never had. Sometimes it's harder to deal with something we never had than to deal with something that we had and lost. And then of course holidays, they run in predictable cycles. You know, Christmas is always December the 25th. And so people with pain and loss also have to anticipate you know, the first Christmas without grandma. Or another Christmas by myself. With time, the scars heal, yes, but the cycle of holidays also become a cycle of times when pain will be more intense than at other times. Yeah, I miss you in uh, February, and yeah, I miss you in July when the sun is hot, and I miss you when school starts, but I really miss you at Christmas. Now, we've been taught that grieving is normal, even healthy, but this does not remove the fact that grieving is painful. Just because it's normal doesn't mean it's easy. Just because you have to go through it doesn't mean there's no pain. And some people faced with the inevitable round of pain that holidays like Christmas will provoke in themselves, they just buckle under and they give way to depression or even worse, they begin to think that maybe suicide is a viable option in eliminating the pain. How many people have said that? It just hurts too much. I just want the pain to stop. And they think that maybe if they take their own lives, well, maybe that'll take away the pain. And we know that that's certainly not the answer. And of course, grieving is nothing new. It is a universal experience. Some say that the pain caused by grief is felt exactly the same way by every person, regardless of their culture, their, lang their language, their religion, their age. Everybody feels the death of a spouse in exactly the same way. Even the Pharaoh of ancient Egypt grieved like you and like me when the angel of death took his firstborn. He wept. He grieved in the same way that you or I would grieve if our firstborn was taken from us. And although Jesus wasn't exactly born in December, there was grief associated with His birth even then. Herod had every male child under two years of age killed in order to eliminate Jesus when he was born. The Bible tells the story of the wailing and the mourning and the grieving of the mothers at the loss of their children. And you know, we kind of read that passage, we read that line and we just fly over it because we want to get to you know, uh, the story about Jesus. There's just a line about Herod. You know. Think about that. Somebody knocks on your door and yes, you know, and the police are there or you know, the military is there or whatever and they say, you have a little boy, a little Johnny here, and how old is he? Well, he'll, he's, uh, he's 18 months, okay, he's coming with us. And you never see him again. These were real people here who lost real children. So if we review the lives of various Bible characters, for example, we'll see that Dealing with grief is as old as man himself, and the way that people dealt with their grief is in perfect accord with the grieving process described in modern psychology. I mean, modern psychology explains the process of grieving, but it didn't invent it. For example, Eve, let's go right back to the beginning. Eve, she grieved for her murdered son. She was in silent shock and only breaks her silence when God finally gives her another child who would grow to be righteous. And she acknowledges that God gave her Seth to replace Abel, Genesis 4, 25, reminding us that this was on her mind. 
and this was on her heart. Job displayed you know, pretty good control despite his terrible losses, but eventually his anger at God began to kind of seep out, right? His accusation was similar to many who have been hurt by severe tragedy. He accused God of not being fair, is not fair. Why me? Why this? Why now? And David the king suffered great anguish at the deceit of Absalom, his beautiful boy, his son, his favorite. He was in major denial, David was. Even though Absalom deceived his father, tried to take the kingdom away from him, even tried to have him killed, David was still trying to save and protect this son of his, and he never even acknowledged his treachery. Talk about denial. And Jeremiah, he saw and warned about the impending destruction of Jerusalem, but no one listened to him. His book of Lamentations is a long and bitter account of his grief and tears over this event. He spent much of his time in depression. Paul the Apostle tried to bargain with God and continually asking him to remove this thorn or this problem that afflicted him. And of course, Jesus himself. Even the Lord prayed to have his suffering removed from him, but to no avail. We witness him finally accepting God's will for him in going to the cross, but not before intense prayer and emotion that caused drops of blood to drip from his forehead. All of these people experience the universal pain of grief and loss like everyone else, and they responded in the same cycle of shock and denial and anger and depression and bargaining and, for some, acceptance that people today go through when they grieve. So I think we have an idea of what grief is, just technically and in our own experience. I've tried to show you that several people in the Bible also experience grieving for their loss in much the same way that we do when we have loss. But what, where's God in all of this? And that's the point I want to make tonight. Our suffering never goes unnoticed by God. Whether we are in Israel 3,000 years ago or we live in modern America during Christmas time, God cares about our pain and sorrow and He provides help to deal with these things whether we are suffering you know, at the point of impact when the loss occurs or at the reminder stations like Christmas and Thanksgiving and other holidays. Here are some of the ways that God helps us with our grieving at Christmas time or at any time of the year. First of all, He provides His, I was going to say love, but I should say He provides His constant love. The loss of a loved one is really the loss of love that was exchanged between that person and ourselves. Yes, we miss the person, but what's the thing that we miss the most? We miss the love that was going back and forth. That's what we miss. We can never again regain that love. The joy that we lose when someone we once loved leaves us, or when something we love to possess or use is lost to us. The only answer to this is to accept the fact that that love is no longer there. That doesn't solve the problem, that just acknowledges what the problem is. We can, however, focus our need for love on the love of God for ourselves that never leaves us and will always be the same. I go back to Jeremiah in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 32 and 33. Listen to what he says in the midst of his suffering. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. God does not send the grief. He doesn't send the sorrow, but he does allow us to suffer it when it comes. But he does send and continues to demonstrate his love for us throughout the sorrow. Paul in Romans 8, 
35 to 39 describes all of the things that have no power to separate us from God's love. Trouble, he says, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, war, death, life, angels, demons, the present, the future, the powers that be, he says. Nothing in all of creation can separate us from God's love in Jesus Christ. Notice he said, not even death. He's not just talking about our death, he's talking about the death of those that we love. Even the loss of the, the ones that we love cannot you know, take away or destroy the love that God has for us. These things, they bring grief and they take away our loved ones, but none of these things can extinguish God's love for us. You know, when the grieving is intense, we need to make that special effort to recognize God's continuing love for us in providing help and life and food and all the resources for our support. These are all signs of His uninterrupted love and we need to stay focused on these. You know, uh, obviously I, none of us knew you know, Carlene, uh, our dear sister, who passed away suddenly. It just took everyone by surprise. She hadn't been, quote, sick or hospitalized. And certainly this sermon was ready to go before this news. But look at all the things that are taking place. All the people that come into action to help the family deal with this profound loss. The small things, you know, we're talking about the food that will be there. These people who are grieving and who are going through a difficult time will be served a, a hot meal by friendly and loving people, many of whom they don't even know. They might not recognize it at the time, but that's God continuing to love them and demonstrating His love to them while they're going through this difficult moment. The cards, the flowers, the messages by the ministers, uh, the, 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 the visits that they will receive. What are all these things? They're a demonstration of God's love for us when we are, when we are suffering. And so we need to stay focused on these things. Yes, I have lost the love of one that I love but I haven't lost God's love. And sometimes there is comfort in reviewing in our minds and in our hearts the manifold ways that God continues to love us as we go through difficult moments. Another thing that God does that uh, I'd like to mention is that He comforts us, but He comforts us directly. See, before I said He comforts us or He loves us in a lot of ways, you know, people and the things that people do, the agents, His agents. But sometimes God comforts us directly. You know, grief is like a heavy coat that just comes over us. You talk about people going through grief and they say, well, it's, it's like a heaviness, right? It's like a heavy stone that weighs on your heart. When you're grieving, it's as if somebody's pressing down on your heart. It hurts physically. It's like a huge wave that just overwhelms us in sorrow and depression. You know, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. My question is, comforted by who? Well, comforted by God. Let's read it again. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted by God. David said, but you, O God, do see trouble and grief. You consider it to take it in hand. The victim commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless, Psalm 10 verse 14. In these passages, God is the direct helper and comforter of the sad and the oppressed. You know, we like to pray, God, please work through your ministers or work through your servants to comfort and heal or direct the hands of the doctors and you know, help the ministers say the right thing and uh, you know, work through your people, Lord. But God, it's true, works through people many times but sometimes he works directly to help, to comfort, to support, and to heal. No middleman, no middleman, just you and God. 
Jesus promised the apostles that he would send the comforter, not only to help their memory, but also to help them in difficult times, to give them, for example, the right words to say when persecuted, Luke chapter 12, verse 12, and to comfort the church in times of difficulty and change, Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Of course, he gives this comfort to the Christian who trusts in God's ability and willingness to deal directly with his hurts and sorrows. I believe in God's direct ability to lift my sorrow. When all of a sudden, you know, from one moment to the next, what seemed impossible, what seemed so difficult, what seemed so hurtful, what seemed that, oh Lord, am I going to have to live with this or deal with this impossible thing the rest of my life that it seems so hopeless, and then somehow in the middle of my prayer, that thing is just lifted from me. The situation hasn't changed. The obstacle is still there. The thing that is causing my pain and my fear is still there, but somehow, somehow I sense in my spirit, I think I'll be okay. I, it's going to hurt, but I, I think I'm going to make it. I'll be okay. Who do you think did that? Satan? <laughs> He's the only other spirit out there interested in working on me. Well, no. Why, why is it that we find it so hard to believe that God will directly work within us when we continually pray to Him? Why should we be surprised that He answers the prayer? I'm not. There are times when our deepest depression is suddenly lifted and we experience that peace that surpasses understanding. You know, that peace that surpasses understanding is not always intellectual enlightenment. We like to think you know, that it's always, if I can understand it, if I can explain it, if I can go one A and B and C and D and therefore you know, summarize and there's the, we think, we have to have that experience in order to have the peace that surpasses understanding, meaning the peace that surpasses understanding happens when we understand. But he's saying the exact opposite. <laughs> it surpasses understanding. I don't know how I got there spiritually. I can't explain it to you. I can't give you an equation. I just know what happened. I understand before I felt lost, before I felt it was impossible, and now I have hope. Can God do that? Absolutely He can do that. Do we ever ask Him to? That's another question. This happens not only because of pills and you know, medication and meditation or exercise and counseling, sometimes it just happens suddenly as God reaches into our lives and personally comforts us with His presence. We don't know how or why, we just know that the grief is gone for a moment, for a day. And so how does God help us? His uninterrupted love if we're willing to see it. And His direct comfort, if we're willing to accept it. And then God also, for those who are grieving, He also supplies hope. The sting of grief is the finality of the event. Death, loss of health, the loss of our partner, the loss of whatever, our job, our mobility, it's gone, no, no getting it back. And it hurts because whatever is lost is not coming back. I remember as a 15 year old, not long after my own father died, he died right in front of me, he had a heart attack. And uh, you know how it is when you're that age or if you've lost somebody, there's a lot of activity going on, you know, the funeral, the relatives coming in and out, you don't have time to think, right? And I remember uh, when everything finished, my mom had to go back to work. I mean, you know, I was 15. 
So she went back to work and then, you know, and I would come home from school and I'd have my key and I'd let myself in. And back in those days, they would show reruns of, of shows. And one of the reruns they showed was of I Love Lucy. Remember I Love Lucy? I think we got the crowd here that knows I Love Lucy. And I still remember the show. You know, it's the I Love Lucy edition where she's working on an assembly line making cakes or something. And she's doo 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 and she's doing okay and the cakes and she's fixing it you know, and they're going by and then all of a sudden, right, she, uh oh, she misses one and the, and the thing starts going faster and faster and, and, you know, and then they've got the canned laughter. You know, everybody's laughing and, and I'm watching this. And the thought that strikes me is, my father is dead and Lucy is still clowning around. She doesn't know my father is dead. Life is just going to go on without him, won't it? His death didn't change anything in I Love Lucy or the hockey game on Saturday night. The only thing it changed was my life. And that's when I understood that he was not coming back. And I would have to go on without him. And 55 years later, I'm still having trouble with that memory. But God supplies hope. God ministers to this pain by providing hope for the future despite the pain of the moment. When we feel that there's no use going on or there is nothing good in the future or there is no future or the future is not going to be like we always thought it was going to be or the future is not going to be like we want it to be or the future is not going to be like it ought to be for ourselves, for our children. When that happens, God gives us hope. He gives us a vision for the future. Isaiah said in reference to the fall of Israel and her destruction, your sun will never set again and your noon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light and your days of sorrow will end. Isaiah 60, 20. In reference to the loss of their leader and Lord, Jesus said to the apostles, because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. I will tell you the truth. You will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. John 16, 6 and 20. In these passages, God makes two promises in providing hope to those who have lost in life and have a bleak view of the future. Promise number one, whatever you've lost, he will replace it with better. The home prepared in heaven will be worth whatever grief we have suffered here. And promise number two, wherever you go, he will be there with you. Whether you grieve in loneliness or illness or loss of position or death, God promises to remain with you and create a future for you with Himself. You may not have a future with your father or your child or your spouse or someone else. Maybe you won't have a future with them, but He promises that you will have a future with Him. So let us not be like the pagans who grieve and who have no hope. As Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, let us believe in God and let us remain faithful to Christ who gives us a hope in a better and an eternal future with Him. And so since this paradox of joy and sadness does exist at this time of year, let's remember a few important ideas that will help us at this time. Important and practical. Idea number one, 
let's be sensitive to those around us who may be covering a broken heart. Christmas is a time for family and rejoicing, absolutely, but it can also be a time when we can minister to those who struggle during this period. Just keep your eyes open. Just keep your ears open. Number two, if you are struggling, try to stay focused on what God has done in ministering to you at this time. Recognize and acknowledge His love for you and go ahead and ask for His direct comfort, His direct intervention. And remember that no matter what, you do have a glorious future through Jesus Christ, no matter how bleak things may seem here and now. And finally, don't resent those who are happy just because you are not. Don't be envious. Realize that sooner or later, we all get our turn to cry. Everybody gets there sooner or later. Don't resent them, pray for them. It'll be healthier for you and healthier for them. Of course, the most sorrowful thing about Christmas is that there are some who are quite happy to celebrate Jesus with gifts and visits and food, but will not accept Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. The loss of our souls will cause us endless grief and sorrow when He returns, and endless grief and sorrow that has no remedy. Let's truly honor Jesus as Lord. Let's truly honor Him as King and Savior today by confessing His name and repenting and being baptized if we have not done that yet or being restored to Him through repentance and prayer if we have fallen away or if we have sinned in such a way that has separated us from Him or from those in the church. If you need to come to Christ tonight, we encourage you, please come forward now as Johnny leads us in a song of encouragement. Shall we stand to sing that song, please?